The title of this exhibition is You Promised Me and You Said a Lie to Me. And indeed, the concept for the exhibition is appropriated and anchored in an 8th century Irish ballad which comes from the oral tradition. This particular ballad has a duplicitous role in the history of literature and language and poetry. It's at once a lament for loss with rich Irish visuals, things like you promised me gloves made of the skin of a fish and shoes made of the wings of a bird. You took my north, you took my south, you took my east, you took my west. But also at the same time, through its translations over several centuries, it became co-opted and reformed. For this particular exhibition, I'm using an 18th century translation from a controversial historical figure called Lady Augusta Gregory. And the way that she interprets a key line in that ballad is the anchor for this show. The line is, you promised me and you said a lie to me. And what Lady Augusta Gregory does is she introduces a comma. You promised me, comma, and you said a lie to me. And that comma for me is a hinge, a kind of axis which, which asks, who owns the promise and who owns the lie? Complicit participants in any system of exchange that can relate to the vulnerable, the interpersonal, it's about loss, it's about encounters, but it's also about a broader cultural, social and political notion of exchange. How do systems of ideology or culture operate for the individual or the protagonist within them? How do you exist within a system of authority but also act within and against it? How do you find your own position? Who owns the promise, who owns the lie? When I was approached by Anna Schwartz Gallery to curate this exhibition, um, I spoke with Anna extensively and this has been such a remarkable platform, this space, and it's such an extraordinary space, the Anna Schwartz Gallery at Carriage Works. Its volumes, its proportions demand a certain kind of response or open the possibility for different kinds of responses to space. And I said to her that I would do the show if I could work with artists that she didn't represent, artists that she'd never worked with before. I wanted to work with international artists with a focus on the Asia Pacific, and I did indeed want to include Australian artists in that mix as well. The show has seven artists, six international and one Australian. There's a number of works which are being commissioned for the exhibition and a number of works which are pre-existing. I wanted museum sort of standard, institutional standard examples of these artists' works and I worked with every single artist through conversation and exchange. I did studio visits with every artist included in the exhibition to try and identify works. Not working with the idea of you promised me and you said a, a lie to me as a sort of thematic, but working with it for, as a propositional kind of platform, a departure point for a conversation about ways into these notions of exchange and identification within systems of authority, power, or indeed the interpersonal. And so each of the artists in the show responded in depth and in kind by producing or making available works responsive to this notion. I was interested in using all the different proportions of this gallery environment in thinking through the exhibition, indeed to use the architecture as a sort of participant in the show, a kind of invisible antagonist. And so the exhibition opens as if you're coming in back of stage, it opens with a giant 14 metre long, 7 metre high scaffold from the French Swiss artist Laurent Grasso. When the viewer walks into Anna Schwartz Gallery, you're confronted with the back of the work. You don't immediately um, have the ability to read the text. You can see that there's something illuminated on the other side, but you have to make a decision to go left or right. The viewer is left to make the choice which way is in and which way is out of the exhibition. Once you move around the work, what becomes visible to you is the phrase, visibility is a trap. And I'm so incredibly fascinated by Laurent's work. He made one of the best exhibitions I saw in 2012, which was a survey, a jeu de pomme of his practice. He had a 45 metre long gallery space and he built in the walls to create a corridor for the viewer. And the corridor had apertures like letter boxes. And as you moved along, you could never get in contact with the work and you could only see them through this single frame kind of window. But behind it was neons, films that deal with environmental catastrophe, social political trauma, eruptions and turbulence, paintings that draw on the kind of medieval era and religious faith and philosophy and indeed one of the works that I saw behind that aperture was this neon text visibility is a trap which I recognized as a line from Michel Foucault's 1971 discipline and power and what I loved about the idea of including in this exhibition visibility is a trap in terms of you promised me and you said a lie to me is that notion again of the complicit participant in constructing a system of authority and power within the show visibility is a trap always lingers behind you as you have to move through the other works in the show to negotiate your own relationship to them. Each of the artists in the exhibition has a substantial international reputation and track record for exhibiting in international biennials, documenta, representing their countries at the Venice Biennale. They have really significant practices and one of the most interesting artists in this show to me is the artist Hae Young, a South Korean artist. I lived in Korea in 2005 for a year which is where I first became aware of Hae work. She works with the everyday in a really unusual and 
empathetic way. She has a real affinity for the kind of remainders of the things that surround us, the kind of surplus productions of living in a capitalist society. And indeed, she transforms them into these really remarkable, rather evocative and promising, potentially enigmatic objects. For this particular show, I wanted light, the idea of light casting meaning, the ability of both darkness and light to obscure and deflect away from being able to ever get beneath the surface of something, the way that people create deflections away from gaining access, but also the idea of migration, transference and psychic projection. You promised me and you said a lie to me as much as anything else is about how you co-opt the voice of another, how you take the persona, and indeed once you've been exiled from a particular place or encounter or system, how you find your own authority or agency, again, how you find purpose. For this particular exhibition, Hague, and I caught up in Hong Kong earlier this year. I told her about the show. She immediately responded because she works very empathetically with historical narratives, excavating through literature, points of departure to think through her constructions and assemblages. She said to me, I'm going to send you a song. And the next morning, she emailed me a link to um, Billy, uh, to Nina Simone, pardon me, singing a version of Strange Fruit, which is a song written by a Holocaust survivor, Albert Mirapol. Albert Mirapol survived the Holocaust, gained asylum in the US, and wrote a song about the slavery and lynchings in the South of America. The song was to be performed by Billie Holiday within the US, but because of racism and civil unrest, the song could only be performed back in Europe from where he'd been exiled. And Hague was interested within this kind of system of transference, the migration of something that was authored in one place, composed for another, and then had to be returned to a departure place of origin. Hague comes from a really interesting generation of Korean artists who were born during the Civil War, but have grown up with that divide between North and South. And I think she has a very interesting understanding of the tension that exists between thresholds, boundaries, territories, and migration. So for this particular work, the strange fruit hanging in the tree, swinging in the breeze, the lines of the song which speak to those bodies are evocatively rendered through these kind of what look like playful, but ultimately kind of amputated and distended um, bodily parts. When developing this exhibition, there was two artists who really responded to the ballad by creating new works for the show. Singaporean artist Heeman Chong, who works with writing, typography as a medium, graphic design as a form, who's a real bibliophile, who's written science fiction novels, who works as a curator, a writer and an artist, responded to the proposition of the poem by offering to paint 51 paintings of book covers where the protagonist is occupied by the persona of another or indeed desires another, projects onto another, wants to subjugate another or is subjugated by another. The books were chosen especially for the exhibition and he really obliterates all representation from the covers and uses graphic forms to talk about how you can or cannot read a book by its cover, who promised and who said a lie. Susan Jacobs, a remarkable Australian artist who I've been privileged to work with previously through exhibitions like the Adelaide Biennial at the Art Gallery of South Australia, responded to the line in the poem, you promised me gloves made of the skin of a fish, you took my north, south, east and west, and has created an intuitive compass on the floor of the gallery using fish skins, magnesite, elements, rocks, strings, water and ceramic bowls filled with a compound of pig's blood and sawdust. It's an elemental bodily and intuitive compass. She's thinking about the way that true north and magnetic north actually have 16 degrees difference. To move navigationally through uncharted waters, you need to know where you've been in order to know where you're going. For the first time since the 1990s, Jane and Louise Wilson, the YBA artists, are presenting two substantial bodies of work that they've created for the exhibition. One is a series of 16 photographs called False Positive, False Negative. They've worked out that you can use face paint to deflect surveillance cameras from enacting facial recognition in public space. You can use the most analog form of mask making to deflect away from technology. These 16 portraits of the sisters themselves are covered in these gra graphic forms which relate back to Russian constructed and propaganda art. They're layered, they're printed onto aluminum photographic images that are then layered over CCTV footage taken of the assassination of a Hamas operative by Mossad in 2010 in Dubai. During three days, three assassins flew into the city, tracked their victim. Every movement was captured on surveillance cameras except for the murder itself, which occurred in a hotel room. The Wilsons have subsequently rented the hotel room and created a film in that space. And for these series of images, the Dubai authorities made the unprecedented move 
of releasing the footage to the public and they've layered themselves over this footage. There's also a work from them called The Toxic Camera which recreates the journey of the Russian filmmaker Shevchenko who flew over Chernobyl in the days after the collapse of the nuclear reactors. When he took his camera back to be developed in the lab he thought that the film had been exposed to light but what had happened was the camera had absorbed so much radiation it had to be buried in a cement vault beneath the earth. And indeed Shevchenko died two years after this incident occurred. Ming Wong, the extraordinary Singaporean artist who received the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale in 2009 for his recreation of Wong Kar Wai films, um, who often inserts himself into uh, historical cinema and world movies and also popular culture to recreate language or persona or representation or identity, who plays between those slippages of self and other, has for this exhibition made available the recreation of the film Persona, which he created for the Performer Festival in New York last year. It's a four screen installation and for this exhibition we're including one screen, the moment in Persona, Ingmar Bergman's film where Liv Ullman's character realises she can no longer speak. Ming invited 17 participants of different ethnicities, genders and persuasions to recreate that moment of silencedness, enacting the fact that you can never truly represent the trauma of silence in any way that has authenticity outside of the moment of trauma itself. The final work in the exhibition is Jessie Jones, the Irish artist who introduced me to the ballad, Derna Lurg. She told me about it after we'd been hypnotised one night in Documenta and Castle. She said, you need to know about this particular ballad. You need to know about its lines. And uh, we, enact, we began this conversation about these ideas of co-option and translation, impression and surplus. And for this exhibition, she came to Australia in 2008 where she recreated Bertolt Brecht's The Rise and Fall of Mahogany in Cooper Pedy with the artist collaborative group DAMP, which was a video work created for the Istanbul Biennial, curated by What, How and For Whom. During that trip to Cooper Pedy, she made a four minute film on the moon plane. And for the exhibition, her work Predicament of Man is a four minute time lapse from dawn till dusk of the kind of center of Australia, the kind of psychological and ontological center, as much as the geographical center. And over it, for a year, she did one hour a day of flow of consciousness writing. She She'd pull from that writing keywords and do image searches. She created an archive of over 100,000 images and this four minute film creates a sequence of layering, this kind of flickering, kind of epileptic kind of saturation of images. Over 10,000 images are layered over this landscape sequence. As a curator, I'm not so interested in working with thematic exhibitions. I like to work with a departure point as a form of proposition or suggestion for the artist. And there's always a really interesting moment when you're working with living artists or commissioning new work or working in this kind of open conversation, expanded form where you meet the show. And you never really know what it is that you're going to be seeing until the show itself is there. And I think in reflection, thinking through this exhibition, these moments of the kind of rise and fall, using the verticality, the presence of light, the persistence of obstruction, the impossibility of obtaining true agency, I think repeats, recurrency, motifs that recur through time are certainly something that is much more textured throughout this exhibition than I really anticipated at the outset. I think something that has come to light through the articulation of You Promised Me and You Said a Lie to Me in the context of this gallery space is that from the moment of departure with this ballad in the 8th century through to this very moment in time and place, it's these things that repeat through time which speak to our humanity more than anything else. And I still think that for, for many artists and for most people, the most political act is to make yourself vulnerable, is to make yourself seen and to be vulnerable, to be open to change, to be open to being wrong and to find your own way to own the agency or persona that you identify most strongly with as the most political of acts.